xylazine hits those same receptors amongst other receptors how do you treat it if we were just talking about xylazine hey everybody welcome back to the channel this is dr b dr b addiction recovery and the topic i want to dissect today and go into briefly is again trank dope how to manage withdrawal symptoms a related question to that that I've been getting a lot, especially out from Philadelphia and Nicole is, why are so many people being put into precipitated withdrawals when they are attempting to manage trank dope withdrawals? Let's get started. I think the best way to approach this is to give you some, a little bit of background on this situation with the trank dope. Keep in mind, trank dope usually is fentanyl, a full agonist opiate, in addition to xylazine, which is an animal tranquilizer. Let's start off with the fentanyl issue first. And the question was, why are so many people being put into precipitated withdrawals when they're being started on probably agonist antagonist therapy like Suboxone, buprenorphine, any of those medications? Why are they going into precipitated withdrawals when you are dealing with trank dope? Let's take that part first, and then we'll hit the xylazine, which is quite a bit an unknown at this time. In general, when you're trying to start someone on suboxone therapy, full agonist versus agonist antagonist therapy, you have to use an opiate withdrawal scale of some sort. I usually use COWS, clinical opiate withdrawal scale. And most people think that the time to start Suboxone is wait 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours. That's wrong. Although it is time dependent, you should start it when there is an appropriate amount of withdrawal symptoms. And that's what using some of these scales to decide when to start your medication are useful for. That being said, what is the issue? The issue is, let's say I'm on fentanyl, heroin oxycodone. And when I give you an agonist antagonist like Suboxone, what it does is knocks off all of the opiates from the receptors and the person gets a sensation of severe radical extreme withdrawals. In the case of fentanyl, people are already having problems in deciding when to start the agonist antagonist the therapy like Suboxone because for some reason, we don't have the same experience as we've always had with heroin, opium, or some of the prescription opiate medications. So it's already complicated enough. And one of the things I do is let's say the clinical opiate scale tells you that when they reach a symptom level of 10, according to that scale, that's when you should do a test dose of Suboxone. With fentanyl, our experience has been that that's already complicated as it is, and we use a simple method. We change the number 10 to 13 or 14. So let me repeat that. To start agonist antagonist therapy, whether it's Suboxone, whether it's buprenorphine, whether it's Subutex, whichever name you go by, you have to wait until a person is at a certain level of withdrawals. That means certain degree of opiates are off the receptors. And now you can safely start your medication assisted treatment. Why? This stuff binds very strongly and rapidly to the receptors and knocks off all the opiates. So if you have too many opiates on there and you put this medication on, because it doesn't give them the rush, the high, and it doesn't have all the euphoric central nervous system effects, they feel like they are in extreme withdrawals. So you use a validated clinical scale that's been scientifically shown to work when they have a certain degree of withdrawals using the scale numerics, you can start that medication. When it comes to fentanyl, for some reason, everyone's clinical experience seems to have been, including mine, that things turn out wacky. Why can they turn out wacky? Well, Sometimes there's other medications of abuse on board, whether it's benzodiazepines, whether it's methamphetamines, and whether that affects your withdrawal symptoms or not, and somehow rocks the scale that you use, that creates complications. 
In this particular case, we're using fentanyl, which as I just said, we've been having some problems using the traditional scale as it is. Now we're adding xylazine. We've already described what that is. It's an animal anesthetic. It's an animal hypnotic. It's an animal sedative. It also causes respiratory depression. It lowers your heart rate, lowers your blood pressure, okay? Now, whether it's the mixture of this medication with the fentanyl that impacts the score on the scale or whether the mixture of this medication changes the chemical processing and metabolism in your body of the fentanyl, I suggest that it is proceeded with more caution and you start the medication-assisted treatment at some later point on the scale. So if you're thinking um, it's been 12 hours, 15 hours, and you're just using time, wrong. Two, a person should be using an opiate withdrawal scale of some sort, and maybe they should give some cushion to that and increase the score that's needed before you start the Suboxone. By the way, this is not for the regular person to use. This is really should be in conjunction with your provider and you shouldn't be doing this on your own. Unfortunately, a lot of people are doing this on their own and trying to manage these issues on their own. And I highly recommend against that. And I think you should go to your provider that's going to start this medication. That being said, there's a second question. Is it possible? Could it be some of the withdrawal symptoms are secondary or related to the xylazine? Here's the answer. We don't really necessarily know. In terms of clinical medicine, the way we get our data is a sort of a hierarchy. Anecdotal medicine is what you hear out there or what one or two cases present to you because there's no experience with this stuff. There's no history of use and there hasn't been data gathered to be put into scientific literature. There are a couple of case reports in the case of xylazine alone by itself. So let's ask, what is xylazine withdrawal like? Because now we're talking about a drug, trank dope, that has opiates, usually fentanyl. It also has the xylazine. So let's pretend, and it is often the case, that people are using and abusing xylazine by itself. I can't give you any formal numbers on the dosing because we don't have gathered data. That being said, let's say someone's using straight xylazine, are they going to have withdrawals? What are those withdrawals like and how do you manage it? We're moving away from the fentanyl and here's the answer. A lot of people don't know this and even though this stuff is prevalent, ubiquitous in the animal veterinary world as an anesthetic for operation, what is the mechanism of action? It is exactly, well, it hits the same receptors for the most part, and for the purpose of this discussion, as the medication clonidine, which many of you are familiar with. What do you think of clonidine as in the substance abuse world? In the regular world, it used to be used as a blood pressure medication. In the substance abuse world, it's used to actually as an anti-anxiety medication, as a little bit of a sedative, as a calming effect. And how does it do that? It hits a set of receptors called alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, adrenaline, and it hits them on the presynaptic membrane. What does that all mean? These receptors are spread out through your entire nervous system, in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system. The effects that we use for the substance abuse patient are in the central nervous system in an area of the brain called locus cerebralis. And what this does is it decreases what's called a sympathetic outflow for the person. What does that mean? Remember fight or flight? Remember adrenaline? Remember epinephrine? Well, it slows that outflow down. What does that do? In your central nervous system, it has a calming effect. It has a slight sedating effect, and it can even be used for sleep. In your cardiovascular system, it decreases blood pressure, it decreases heart rate, and it can also decrease respiratory rate if enough is used. Xylazine 
hits those same receptors amongst other receptors. So although we don't have robust data in humans, we can think about what would be the withdrawal effects of xylazine in a human being. It's hitting the same receptor and having quite a bit of impact in the central nervous system. And that's why it's probably cut and mixed with fentanyl besides the fact that it makes the production much cheaper. What it's going to do if you suddenly stop this medication, potentially increase your heart rate, increase your blood pressure, cause anxiety, cause sleeplessness. Is it dangerous to withdraw from xylosine? Can you get addicted to it? Well, there's one or two case reports out there that show a person escalated their use of this medication over time. So there's probably a significant abuse potential as well as escalating doses. One, if you suddenly stop it, what can happen? We don't really know, but we can infer and draw some educated guesses that the person might have increased blood pressure. And if it has any impact like clonidine does, you can go into what's called the ventricular tachycardia. What does that mean? And eventually lead to arrhythmia. That is the part of your heart that pumps out blood and it starts to start pumping in an irregular and fast way, eventually leading to a cardiac dysrhythmia, which can lead to cardiac arrest. This is speculation because I'm basically comparing it to clonidine, but these are potential withdrawal side effects. How do you treat it if we were just talking about xylazine? Well, you can do crossover tolerance with different medication. There are many medications that kind of fall into this alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist, but the one that comes to mind that a lot of you may know is clonidine. If the person is having symptoms to straight withdrawal from xylazine, this would be a medication that could be potentially substituted as controlling some of these withdrawal symptoms. Another one is Presidex, which is a short-acting medication often used in hospitals. You can also consider muscle relaxants and other sedatives as well. Now, let's take both of these medications or both of these substances with xylazine and opiates and say, let's assume a person has been using these and now we want to manage withdrawal. Again, all of this should be under the care of a physician, potentially in the hospital, because we don't really know the potential side effects of xylazine withdrawal at this time. And I know a lot of you don't have resources to be in the appropriate situation, but you need to be forewarned and you need to know that you should really do this under the care of a physician. So if, you're, if I was managing both of these withdrawals at the same time, and I knew that the only thing I had to deal with was fentanyl and xylazine, I would do what I know first. I would attempt to use my clinical opiate withdrawal scale and wait the right appropriate amount of time until they have significant withdrawals, add a little bit of time to that and let them have a little higher score and initiate the induction of suboxone type products or buprenorphine type products. And I would make sure that I have that under some control. Now I have completely masked the opiate withdrawals. Anything left over is going to potentially be, again, in theory, assuming there's no methamphetamine issues, there's no benzodiazepine issues, there's no alcohol issues. Now I know what I have, I have unmasked pure xylazine withdrawals. What are we going to be looking at? Potentially hypertension, potentially increased heart rate, potentially anxiety. Is there going to be seizures? I don't know. And I don't think anybody at that point knows. Now, once I've unmasked that and I see some of these symptoms that I'm describing now, at this point, I would probably initiate clonidine, low dose, 0 0.1 milligrams, 0 0.2 milligrams, and see if I can get that under control. How long are they going to be on it? I don't know. I suspect not long, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days, not sure, but I'm going to keep that dose very low and monitor the patient closely and eventually taper off of the clonidine 
or any other adjunct medication I have added. In short, we're talking about withdrawal symptoms of a medication that we don't know much about in humans. We don't know the long-term effects. We don't know the withdrawal effects. We don't know the if there's any potentially dangerous withdrawal effects. But what I would do is basically clean up what I have in front of me. First, I would treat the opiate withdrawal, and I would use medication-assisted treatment, agonist antagonist, buprenorphine, suboxone, whatever you want to call it. I would get that under control. Now I have unmasked any leftover withdrawal symptoms of xylazine, and I would attempt to gain control of that by replacing the xylazine with an appropriate cross-tolerance medication. I would probably pick clonidine or something of that nature and attempt to get that under control and then try to wean them off of that and proceed with the treatment and plan of care as dictated by the patient's presentation. This is a public service message. I want to inform people out there that, you know, this is no joke. This is dangerous stuff. You shouldn't do this on your own. Get in and get help if you can. And I hope this helps you out in proceeding with your life. Thank you very much. See you next time. Peace.